water down. Hi, Toronto. Thank you for having me. So this is a brand new talk that I've written just for this. Um, it's how to build a serious career by making silly work. And it's kind of a counterintuitive approach to everything that I thought I had to do to like make it as a serious designer. And I want to share that with you today. So over the years, I've, there we go. <laughs> over the years, I've had a lot of titles. How many of you have gone by different things over the course of your career? Or maybe you have like three titles right now, like art director, illustrator. Can I get a show of hands? OK, cool. Because that's how most of us are. So I started out um, when I was a kid. I wanted to be an artist. And then when I went to high school, I was like, you know what? Art direction sounds pretty good. It's kind of a practical intersection between art and then doing something serious. And then I became a lettering artist. And then I started calling myself a creative, which who knows what that means. It's kind of all encompassing. And maybe an entrepreneur. I started teaching classes as well. And now in 2019, I've just decided to refer to myself as an artist. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I wanted to flash this really quick. This is my serious design career starter pack, clients, press, awards I've won, photo of, black and white photo of me with my arms crossed, and I just got verified on Instagram. In all seriousness though, <laughs> those were all of the kind of conventional, like serious career markers that I've spent the first, I spent the first half of my career trying to achieve. And I have been able to work with really big clients. I did a line of Hallmark cards in 2015. I did work for MailChimp and got interviewed and was on their homepage. I got so many emails from my friends this day. I've done Target gift cards. My boyfriend made me take a picture when we were in Target, when we found it actually, because it's not at every single one. And two summers ago, I went out to Google's headquarters to paint a mural um, in their virtual reality office. And so when I was a student, I used to look at designers that I admired, like Jessica Hish and Dan Cassaro, John Contino, and I would look at them doing all these amazing projects for these big clients, and I would think to myself, how the fuck did they get those projects? Like, did they just work really, really hard? Did they, uh, you know, are they just more talented than everybody else? Is it them putting in more late nights and burning the midnight oil? Do they just really want it badly? Do they want it more than everybody else? Or is it just luck? And you know, with these ones, I think that it's probably a mix of all of them. Like, who knows? Everyone has a different path. And I'm really excited to share mine with you today because it's really fun. Literally, it is fun. So my, I guess, path of success, if you could say, has always been to follow the fun. It, again, is a counterintuitive approach to getting serious work for serious clients. But when I was writing this talk, I realized that all of the serious career opportunities that I've been afforded have been directly, I could directly trace them back to silly projects that I did just for fun, my passion projects. And so people don't know me, necessarily know me for my work I did for Google or Target or whatnot. No one ever comes up to me in the street and is like, oh my gosh, you're Lauren Hom, you did those Target gift cards. But what people do come up to me and say is, hey, you're Lauren, you do daily dishonesty, right? Or, hey, you're Lauren, you do ex-boyfriend tears. Or, hey, you're Lauren, aren't you the one who puts bread on her head? I promise I'll explain this if anybody is really fucking confused right now. But what I'm trying to say is you can build a serious career by making not so serious work, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. And you know, I think silly stuff can lead to the serious stuff, it's just that over the course of us growing up from like being kids to getting, becoming adults, we forget about that because we are surrounded by more serious messages. So here's me as a kid. I was always a pretty silly kid, you know, liked to play, wasn't afraid to be weird. I love how kids just say whatever they want and they're not embarrassed yet because life hasn't shit on their dreams. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was thinking back to this because I was digging up old photos and I found this photo of me too. I used to draw whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted. How nice does that sound, right? Once we get into our serious careers, we get all in our heads about what we're supposed to make and who we're supposed to make it for. And I actually zoomed in here. It says, when I grow up an artist, so even though I was six and maybe my grammar wasn't great, sentence structure, poor, we know what I was trying to say. When I grow up, I want to be an artist. 
But as I grew up, I started to absorb these messages around me and the world just kind of taught me these things. You know, you only get dessert if you finish your vegetables or you, know, you work first and then you retire and have fun. And I also absorb messages like, you know, the harder you work, the more successful you'll be, or no pain, no gain, or my personal favorite, nothing worth having comes easy. And these aren't necessarily bad messages. I wanna say that I think there is a time and a place for these kind of like work hard, hustle messages, but because of their prevalence, I think that they tend to lead a lot of us astray because that's all we're consuming and we think that the path to success is by outworking everybody else. And so working hard does work, but it only works for a little while. Uh, and so of course, you know, absorbing all those messages, I naturally went into advertising uh, because it seemed like a good intersection between doing something creative that I wanted to do and appeasing my parents and letting, getting them to let me go to art school because it was gonna be more practical too. I like showed them like the glass door surveys, like the career path. And you know, little did I know that advertising was also gonna be the industry that like embodied the work hard mentality. Um, I remember hearing, you know, if you wanna impress your boss, be the first to arrive and the last to leave at the office. And I was all about that for a while. But like I said, it's working hard only works for a while because it's not sustainable. Um, it's not necessarily enjoyable and you don't necessarily always have the stamina for it. It works really well like from like 19 to 23 maybe when you're young and hungry and have a lot of caffeine and booze and don't get hangovers yet. But other than that, it's not really sustainable. <laughs> And so that's why a lot of people burn out, including myself. But before I get to the burnout part, I want to bring us back to a happier time. So on October 8th, 2012, I still remember the date, my roommate Sophie and I ate a small wheel of cheese and drank two bottles of wine. Happier times. So, oops, darn it, that was supposed to be my punchline. <laughs> okay, never mind. So I'll tell the story then, okay. My cover's been blown. All right, so we were seniors at the School of Visual Arts. We were both doing advertising. She switched to design later. And we were having our monthly like wine and cheese night. Usually don't do two bottles of wine at wine and cheese night, but whatever. And we started talking about all the things that we wanted to do in our spare time uh, that year. I was like, I want to go to Bikram Yoga every day. Has anyone ever been to hot yoga? It's brutal. OK. I wanted to go to that every day. Not good. She was like, oh, I want to brew my own beer. And we were like, yeah, we totally have space in our closet for you to brew your own beer. And then we decided we were going to start a baking blog together. And all of a sudden, we looked at each other, like, you know, halfway into the second bottle of wine and burst out laughing because we were totally full of shit. Um, we knew we didn't actually have any time to do all these things. Senior year of any school is insane. And I realized, huh. I lie to myself all the time like this, like in an innocent way, not in like a sinister way. And this sparked the idea for daily dishonesty. So how many of you are familiar with this project? This is like a throwback. Ooh, I see a decent amount of hands. I'm surprised. I feel like we've entered into the age where when I bring up Tumblr, not everyone knows what I'm talking about. And that makes me feel old, even though I'm not. So. What Daily Dishonesty was, uh, was a hand lettering blog. I was studying ad, but I had taken a communication design class, one like intro to typography class, and fell in love with it. And so on the side, I had always doodled, drawn stuff, would like write my name pretty, or write my friends' names. And with this idea, I realized we had all these little white lies that my girlfriends and I told ourselves. So I cataloged them on this Tumblr blog called Daily Dishonesty, I'd make a new piece every couple of days to go along with the theme of it's not every day. And I started posting these just to a Tumblr blog. Things like, I'll be there in five minutes. I've read and agreed to the terms and conditions where you just check the box and sign away your soul. Just one bite. Uh, for anyone with roommates, I'll do the dishes later. Or I guess even if you don't have roommates, that's still very applicable. But anyways, I was posting these and enjoying them just to this blog. And what happened was kind of nuts. It caught a wave of the internet where people started to take notice. At first I had, you know, 100 followers, and then 1,000, and then 5,000. And then it caught another wave of the internet where design blogs started writing about it. I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Tina Roth-Eisenberg. I know she spoke here 
first. I wasn't in yet to watch her talk, but I have seen her speak before. She actually posted about daily dishonesty back in 2013. So I wanted to give her a shout out and say thank you for helping to advance my creative career. But I remember it was like halfway through senior year, we were sitting in the computer lab and my friend turned to me and she was like, holy shit, Swiss Miss just posted about your project. And I wrote to Ina like a nice thank you email. But it's a really, really small world. You never know who's going to see your work. And then I get an email from a literary agent who says, hey, I stumbled across your work. I think it has potential to be a book. And I thought to myself, this has got to be a scam. Like, who offers a 21-year-old a book deal? If you look closely at the date, too, this is my birthday. Um, so it is coming up, too. And if, I want to zoom in for a second here. She said she found me on Pinterest. And what confused me at the time and why I thought it was a scam was because I didn't have a Pinterest at the time. But it turned out that somebody else had pinned it to their board, and it started circulating there. And so people share things that make them laugh. And humor doesn't have to be your strategy, but it's worked really well for me because if you can make someone laugh, they're much more likely to share it with their friends who have that same sense of humor. Just think about like all the memes you send back and forth in your group text or in DMs to your friends. And this is what I like to call lazy marketing. When you use humor, you attract the right people who share your same sense of humor, they share it with their friends, and you have to do less work. It, they do the marketing for you, which is kind of like everybody's dream. So after all this crazy daily dishonesty stuff, I actually did respond to that email, it wasn't a scam, and daily dishonesty ended up being turned into a book in 2014. I ended up entering it into award shows and winning awards for it. This is me recording my speech at the Webbies. Because of it, the creative director at Los Angeles Magazine reached out to me and said, hey, saw your work on a you know, type blog. I'd love to hire you to do our feature opener uh, this month. So there's me. My dad took this photo holding uh, my very first big editorial project. And from there, that opened the floodgates for more editorial work. So Daily Dishonesty was the thing that helped me break into the editorial illustration world as well. So here's a little brief breakdown. Silly, got drunk, so <laughs> got shit-faced with my roommate. That led to me having an idea for a project that I acted on. So I have this thing where there's usually like a week span between when I have an idea and when I need to get it done before it just completely dissipates. I don't know about all of you, but I feel like there's this window of opportunity that you're excited about something, but then once it falls off your radar, it's really hard to pick back up. It is possible. But for me, I try to take action within the first like, week of having something because I know that's when I'm most likely to get it done. So after that, you know, got a book deal, which was kind of crazy. Signed a book deal the same week I was graduating from college. Uh, won awards for this, you know, boosted myself up in the industry. Started getting freelance work. And this all led to me ending up getting my illustration agent. So take yourself seriously, but don't take your ideas too seriously. And so this was a silly project that taught me to start taking myself seriously as a designer. I feel like there's kind of a pivotal moment in everybody's like design career where you feel like you, maybe you have the word like aspiring in your Instagram bio, like aspiring photographer or aspiring hand letterer. And there's that moment where you realize maybe it's your first big freelance project, maybe it's your Instagram following, maybe it's you know, someone you admire saying they like your work, whatever it is. I feel like we all have that moment where we realize like, oh, yeah, like I'm legit. I'm a real designer. And this was that for me. Daily dishonesty made me realize that, hey, I'm a real designer. I'm taking myself seriously. I could actually do this. Um, but it's important to not take the ideas too seriously. So for anyone who's an overthinker, my, my saying is thinking is good until it stops you from taking any action. So if you're a, a chronic overthinker, just know that take your ideas a little less seriously and maybe something serious like this could happen. Who knows? So even when you're following your fun and being silly, uh, fear can always creep back in. And that is a common theme that I want to talk about today is all these things I'm talking about, about being silly and having fun, like I mess up at this all the time too. Like I just came out of a crazy month of doing like holiday rush freelance work and I haven't been having a lot of fun lately. So I want you all to know too that even though I'm on stage talking about all this, this talk is just as much for me to remind myself to have some fun uh, as it is for you. So 
right around this time too, graduated college, daily dishonesty stuff, I, even though all this good stuff had happened, I still got a full-time job. I had studied ad for four years, and I couldn't give up the thought of wasting my, like, wasting my four-year degree. And also, I was scared. No one I knew was freelancing. I didn't think I could do it, so I got a full-time job. And I want you to know that that is 100% okay. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to make decisions out of fear and learn from them. So I got a full-time job, and then, right around the same time, I went through a breakup, so it was just like, Wham, wham. But here is a photo from 2013. If you can read the post-it, it's pretty cute. Um, I went through my breakup and I was venting to my coworker at our desk while we were eating lunch. And he was being great, he was just humoring me. And I was like, oh, I like, really hate him, blah, blah, blah. And I saw a block of post-it notes sitting on my desk. And just on a whim, I wrote the words ex-boyfriend tears on a post-it note and slapped it to my water bottle. And it made him laugh. And so I put it on my desk for the rest of the day, and every coworker who walked by would stop and be like, oh my gosh, that's amazing, that's so funny. And so I thought to myself, huh, maybe I can do something with this. So I turned it into a product. Uh, I took like a week of time and like a couple hundred bucks and created ex-boyfriend tiers, which were a line of flasks and mugs and cups at first, but then ultimately just with flasks because glass and ceramic really suck to ship. For anyone who does products, glass and ceramic is brutal. So using the platform I had built from Daily Dishonesty, I posted about ex-boyfriend tears thinking, hmm, if people liked the Daily Dishonesty humor, maybe they'll like ex-boyfriend tears. So I posted it, went back to work, and then maybe four hours later, checked back in, and it had 12,000 likes and reblogs, and I couldn't figure out what happened. And then I like, looked deeper into like, the reblog role, and it turns out that John Green, the author, had been following Daily Dishonesty and reblogged this image onto his blog. And so within a couple days, I had sold out of everything I had ordered and had to completely restock. I ended up getting my first wholesale order, too. I sold on Rest in Peace, Nasty Gal, for a while. Uh, and that was really exciting for me to see something I had made on a site that I had shopped on before. So another breakdown, silly, made a sassy joke about my ex, turned it into a project. Someone famous saw it and shared it. You really never know who's looking. It got me my first wholesale order. It built my confidence. And I ended up selling $10,000 worth of these over, the, over maybe two years. I stopped doing them because I couldn't do the shipping myself. But I've been thinking about bringing them back someday. And so even though this was a sad thing, you know, going through a breakup, you can get silly with the way you approach things, and you can have a lighthearted approach to it, and it can yield an interesting result. So especially after Daily Dishonesty and now this, I realized that, OK, I've done this two times in a row, so maybe it's not a coincidence that this happened. Like, I'm doing something, and it's working. And so those two projects back to back built my confidence up to the point where I ended up going freelance. And I, have never, I haven't looked back since. So, Doing silly projects, too, can build up your confidence in yourself because you're putting a little bit of yourself out there every time, and it's a really vulnerable thing to be silly and to show your personality. But when you get that kind of like confirmation from your audience that, huh, people like this, it can really build up your confidence and allow you to do great things and take more risks. So here's me in my very first studio. Um, I bought that iMac with a $500 gift certificate I won to my school's computer store because I entered a t-shirt design contest. Um, and so I was freelancing, trying to figure it out, trying not to be super scared. And I started a project called Will Letter for Lunch. So I had been doing that kind of three-dimensional daily dishonesty style for a while, and I was worried I was going to pigeonhole myself. I was worried, oh no, like what if that style goes out and I'm not going to be able to get any work? So I wanted to diversify my portfolio. And what Will Letter for Lunch was, Will Letter for Lunch was, was a project where I was hungover one morning and I was looking for brunch with my friend, actually the same friend who was there with me for Daily Dishonesty. And we noticed all of the little A-frame boards outside of uh, the cafes. They were all kind of written terribly. And I turned to her and I was like, none of these boards are convincing me or like enticing me to eat at any of these places. And she turned back and said, yeah, you could probably do it so much better. And I had my light bulb moment, and I was like, huh, I could. I'm a letterer. Like, if I can do it in pencil, why can't I do it in chalk? And so Will Letter for Lunch was born. Uh, the concept was that I would go into restaurants, offer to redo their chalkboard signs outside, 
in exchange for nothing more than exactly what I wrote on the menu board. So if I wrote dumplings, I got paid in dumplings. If I wrote Greek food, I got paid in Greek food. And as soon as I posted this project, it started spreading around the internet. Oh, whoa. And I even ended up uh, in the local newspaper in New York. I still, whenever I go to my grandma's house, she has these uh, newspapers still out on the table. It's really cute. <laughs> But I remember being amazed because, you know, I didn't invent bartering. I wasn't the first person to walk in and like pitch their services to another business. And this project just kind of took hold because I figured, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I'll try it out. I'll print these flyers. If no one says yes, no big deal. No one knows about it. But it ended up taking off and I ended up starting to book real chalk work. So this is a video I did with Microsoft for their holiday card one year. I started doing chalk murals. Um, this was in Chobani's headquarters, the yogurt I guess, company uh, in New York. And I even did digital talk lettering for Samuel Adams, and it ended up in one of their national commercials. And so I started doing all this chalkboard work basically just for fun um, and to get some press and to see if it would work, kind of to test my idea out. And I started doing it, getting paid in cheeseburgers, and ended up booking real work for real clients. And then I love sharing this story because I've re only recently started sharing it. So about maybe six months into doing this project, there was a food festival near my house in Brooklyn, and I figured that, oh, I can take my flyers there and just you know, pass out 30 of them in one go, it'll be efficient. So I went to the food fair, I passed out my flyers to all the vendors, and a week later I got an email that said, hey, uh, this is you know, so-and-so from Skillshare, you passed out a flyer to our CEO the other day, and we've been wanting to do a chalkboard class and haven't been able to find somebody, and he gave me your flyer, and we'd love to bring you in and do a chalkboard class with you. And I remember thinking, I don't think I saw the CEO of Skillshare anywhere. And then I Googled him, and I realized that, yes, indeed, I had passed out a flyer to him. He was working at a New Orleans-style soup and sweet tea stand with his friend. I don't know if that was his like weekend side hustle or something, but he was the CEO of Skillshare. And I passed my flyer out to him, so I went in and worked with them. I taught my first Skillshare class. Um, it was the first time I had ever broken down my process into a teachable format. They had like a producer there to help, me, help walk me through it, and it was so valuable. And this actually acted as the catalyst for all the classes that I teach now, so without Will Letter for Lunch, and without you know, Skillshare, I, wouldn't be, I probably wouldn't be speaking as much, I probably wouldn't be teaching as much, and so you really never know who you're gonna meet. So a little breakdown. Silly, wanted free food, made a project, as always, um, usually within the first week of having the idea, because it's the golden window. People shared the project all around. Uh, this led to a ton more client work, and it also introduced me to Skillshare and kicked off my teaching career. So it's easy to brush off something as just like a silly idea, like no one's gonna like it, like, but what's the worst that can happen? You know, if you make something and you post it and no one sees it, no big deal, try again. If you make something and post it and everybody sees it, great. So whenever I'm kind of getting in my own way and thinking, you know, why would anyone, why should I make this? Like, it's stupid, it's silly. I always ask myself, what's the best thing that could happen in like a dream world? If I made this, who might share it and what might happen for me? And when I think in that capacity, it tends to allow me to be like, you know what, I'm just gonna go for it, no big deal. I recently heard uh, the illustrator Lisa Congdon talk about how quantity will lead to quality when it comes to developing yourself as an artist. And you do have to put a lot of stuff out there in order to figure out your voice and figure out your style and get to where you wanna be. So anytime you start to get in your own way, remind yourself, what's the best thing that could possibly happen, and hopefully it entices you to make, make the thing. If it excites you uh, or it makes you laugh, it is 100% worth doing, and that's something that I absolutely want to stress because all that really matters is you are enjoying the work, especially when it comes to these self-initiated projects. We spend so much time using our creative energy to help clients like sell their products and work on their websites and their campaigns. But what about doing something for you? I have always considered passion projects as kind of like a creative self-care. And so think about the last time you made something fun for you, and if it's been a while, maybe you should make something fun. I hope this talk inspires you too. I hope this talk inspires me to make something as fun as the stuff I'm about to show you. So the thing I'll always ask myself too is, 
would my friends and I think this is funny? That's kind of my like market tester when I'm thinking of an idea is if I think something's funny, I'll think about would Sophie like it, would Tiffany like it, would Becca like it, basically any of the people who are in your group text or the people you hang out with. And in early 2016, I was scrolling on Instagram and Music festival season is like April-ish, I think, in the States. And so it was like February, and I saw all these like music festival things starting to pop up. And I noticed people were wearing flower crowns, of course. And my brain, just being a letterer too, made a visual pun. And I was like, oh, what if it was the other kind of flower, like F-L-O-U-R? And then I did that thing where I got in my own way, and I was like, no, that's stupid. And then I thought about it, and I texted Sophie and Tiffany, and they thought it was funny. And so I was like, you know what? No, it's not stupid. I think it's fun. And so I just felt like making it. So this is my project, Flower Crowns. It has nothing to do with lettering whatsoever, but again, if you're excited about it, it's totally worth making. So I kind of parodied normal flower crowns and made them out of bread and cookies and cake. Some cinnamon rolls, got some cupcakes. Ooh, these wafer ones are good. And then I found this really cool watermelon bread when I was traveling uh, in Indonesia, I think. So I made them. I shot about 20 of them in one go and then just dripped them out on my Instagram. And a lot of people have asked me too, especially when I started this project, they were like, are you worried you're gonna lose followers because people are used to seeing you do lettering and now this is gonna be so jarring. And I've always been a believer that if someone unfollows me because there's a photo of me wearing, putting toast on my head, then they should probably unfollow me because I can't change my personality or my sense of humor and if anyone's ever been like a little bit anxious about losing followers or your following's not big enough, you can kind of think, think of it as like, just like filtering through the pot. It's like when you eat trail mix and you only pick out the stuff that you wanna eat and then there's just like the raisins left at the bottom. You could think of those people who unfollow you as your raisins and you just want the good stuff in your audience anyway. So don't worry, don't worry too much about it. If you follow me on Instagram, you're used to these food analogies. I just made that up and I don't know where that came from, but I think I'm gonna use it from now on. So I would post these, I would drip them out and you know, nothing really happened, from, nothing huge happened from this project. If anything, again, filtered through my followers. Um, People who did like it just liked me even more. So you could think of it not as losing followers, but strengthening the bond you have already with people who were already bought into what you're doing. I heard someone once say too that losing followers is not a bad thing because those people weren't gonna buy from you anyways. They weren't gonna tell their friends about you anyways. So it really is quality over quantity when it comes to social media followings. And with this project, another question I get a lot is, how the fuck did you make these? Like, do you have a studio? What lights did you use? What camera did you use? Who did your hair? Um, where'd you learn to pose like that? Just the internet, I learned to pose like that from Instagram girls. But when I talk about silliness too, get silly with how you approach like your business and how you interact with your followers. So I shared this uh, right after I launched Flower Crowns, I wrote a big blog post about this. This is how I make these. <laughs> This is uh, my grandma's trash alley back in California. <laughs> I was staying with her for a couple weeks and I happened to have the idea right before I went to go visit her. So I bought a bunch of paper rolls um, you know, on Amazon, shipped them to my grandma's house. I have a little digital camera, it's nothing fancy. I think it's a Canon G7X if anyone's curious. That's a little tray table, little tripod. Um, got my little coconut for a snack and I'm just sitting on a stool. My brother, snapped this photo of me while I was taking these and I was like, don't you dare fucking show that to anybody. And then I realized it was gonna be a funny, like teachable moment, so I had him send it to me and I made a blog post about it. And what I want to tell you about this too is you don't need a lot of fancy equipment to make a passion project and you don't need to have you know, X, Y, and Z as a prerequisite to start making silly work. If anything, I think it's more challenging and you get more creative when you're working within some constraints. And so with this project, the, I guess the biggest thing that came out of it was Wix reached out to me and they were like, hey, we love this project, we'd like to sponsor it. So I got a little sponsorship with Wix, that was pretty cool. Uh, and I did a couple other projects with them throughout the years. But yeah, it was, it was really just a for me fun thing that I thought was funny and that my friends thought was funny and it felt really good to make. So kind of taking it back to that photo I showed of me uh, you know, with the chalk drawing on the floor 
I don't remember the last time that I felt completely free and like limitless when, when drawing and making something. There, there were no preconceived notions of what I had to do. Making something just for fun is as close as you can get to go back to that like childlike state of play. And I need to get back to it soon. And I, I encourage you all to don't overthink it. Don't think what's going to happen because of this. Are people going to like it? Just think, do I want to make it? And if you do, you should totally make it. And don't worry about finding your style. So like I was saying, people always ask me, were you worried about losing followers because it's not lettering? And my answer is, no, not really, because that's my personality. And I think that worrying about finding your voice or focusing on finding your voice is so much more important than focusing on finding your style, because I feel like oftentimes the two phrases are kind of used interchangeably, but they're actually not the same, because I want everyone to think back to what they wore for their mid eighth grade, middle school, like class portrait. Think about how much your style has changed over the years, your taste in music, um, but specifically your fashion style or fashion sense because I wore some pretty heinous things when I was 13 and I do not want to see those photos. But think about it that way. Your style is going to be ever evolving and so don't worry too much about picking a medium or picking a specific lettering style or photography style. Part of being creative and part of why people follow you and are, will be interested in your work is because of your creativity and because of your imagination and because of the fact that you will change and you will evolve. Seeing the same thing over and over again isn't always super exciting. And you can think of it as you know bands who have been around for a decade. Um, one of my favorite bands is Fall Out Boy and everyone makes fun of me for that. But I always say they've been making music for 10 years and so no one can shit on them. But what I'm trying to say is your style is going to change so much, so don't worry too much about it. Your voice, on the other hand, is something that is a little bit more permanent because you as a person, you are who you are and you probably won't change a ton more and when you actually dig into who you are and what your point of view is and what your voice is, that's when people will start to follow you and that's when your work will start to get more recognition when you get comfortable sharing those bits of yourself. And when you find your voice, you empower others to find their voices as well. So after doing you know, four years of my own silly projects, I had started to accumulate messages and emails from people who would ask, you know, how do you make these? Like, what is your process like? And so I started teaching a class where I now teach other people how to have fun with their work. So I wanted to share a couple student projects. So this is one of my students, Nick Masani. He's amazing. If you don't follow him already, you should. He loves like old decorative type and mosaics. He used to work for Louise Feely. Um, and he was looking for a project where he could explore all those things. And he ended up coming up with mosaics. So these are all digital mosaics. They're incredible. He paints each piece, like hand, he hand paints each piece and like tiles them up in Procreate or Photoshop. I can't even, can't even remember what he uses. But this project got so much press because it was, it's beautiful, one, but it's truly something that he's passionate about. And passion is so important, too, because when it comes to anything in your career, the follow through and the consistency is really, really important. If you make one awesome piece for Instagram, that's great. But if you can make a series of 10 or 20 and drip that out over time, it gives you a reason to talk about your work over and over again. It gives people a reason to keep checking back in to see if you've posted a new piece in your series. And I just find that working in series is a really powerful marketing tool that anyone can implement. So if you start thinking in that way, you also start building like badass portfolio pieces too. This one is Overreactions by one of my students, Annie. Um, she's really passionate about women's health. She's a stop motion animator and like clay artist. And so she decided that it would be fun to combine those passions and turn them into a series of like period positive uh, you know, pieces that she sculpted out of clay and was making by hand. So I believe the one in the middle is riding the crimson, surfing the crimson wave or surfing the crimson, crimson tide. And the one uh, over here on the right <laughs> is, uh, what is it, panty painting? Anyways, that, ooh. <laughs> but anyways, it, it just goes to show you that any topic can be the basis of a passion project, whether it's silly. Um, I love the little smiley face she put on the diva cup. It's amazing. Whether it's silly, whether it's serious, if you approach it, if you are into it, you will approach it with a lightness that other people will be able to see. And you'll be able to keep making those pieces too. How many of you have ever started a project like one weekend and been so stoked about it, 
and then it just kind of tapered off and you never made another one and didn't pick it back up. That happens to me all the time too, so it's okay, but when you really give a little bit more time to thinking through your ideas and thinking about if you're excited and what it could look like as a series, that can help to actually make sure you follow through. And this last project I wanna show you from one of my students, this is Intro Flirted. How many of you are introverts? Can I get a raise of hands? Any extroverts? Okay, cool. I'm an extrovert. I took the Myers-Briggs test and I think I like, I'm an extrovert, but I do spend a lot of time alone and most designers spend a lot of time alone. So this is from one of my students, Josh. He's an introvert and he's, he wanted to celebrate that. And so he created a line of love notes just for introverts. And even though I'm an extrovert, I read these and I thought they were so funny. My favorite is the we should go out, but not like out, out. Because that describes me now that I'm in my late 20s, like every weekend. Like, I like to talk about going out, but I like to actually stay in. And he started posting these to a blog. He just, he, I think he did one per week for a whole year. So he ended up with 52 of these and turned it into a book. Um, you know, this, this Instagram account, I think, got 4,000 followers in the course of a year. And I remember him emailing me saying, I can't believe I have 4,000 followers for this account when you know, my personal account I've had for like five years and I have less than half of that. And so that's the power of a passion project too, um, especially a fun one, is that it's condensed and it's focused and people know what they're getting. It's kind of like people know what they're subscribing to and it's a really powerful, it's a really powerful portfolio piece and now he's branded himself as like the intraflirt guy and it's worked really well for him the same way that I kind of inadvertently branded myself as the silly passion project person. What you do a lot of is what people will know you for. And if you're worried about pigeonholing yourself and you know, if I, I remember Annie asking me, if I do this period project, am I gonna be known as the period girl? And I looked at her and I was like, yes, you will. But it's not a bad thing because being known for one thing at first can help put you on the map. I was the daily dishonesty gal for the longest time. It's what you do with that afterwards that will you know, really define who you are as a creative and define your career. So being known for one thing at first, um, even if it feels like you're pigeonholing yourself, can actually be really great for momentum for you to use as a springboard to get to the next thing. So people like being around the person who's having fun at the party, and that's kind of how I view making silly work. Um, the party is the internet, and you know, you, we're, all, we're all there. And, it's easier to grow an audience when you're enjoying what you do and people can tell um, you know, when you're having a lot of fun with your work. So even though humor, if humor isn't your thing, um, that's okay too. But if, as long as you put a lot of yourself into your work and you're having fun with it and you're sharing bits of yourself, that is the best way to grow like a sustainable, long-term kind of personal brand. And embrace your inner weirdo. So these projects that I've shown you have kind of run the gamut of weirdness. I'd say flower crowns probably being the weirdest one that I showed you. Uh, and showing your weird true self will attract people who also like that kind of stuff and like repel people who don't. And like I said, it's like your trail mix. I don't know if anyone likes raisins in here, so I'm sorry if anyone does, but for me, it's like just getting rid of all the raisins in the trail mix and I just have the chocolate chips and the peanuts and stuff. And it's okay, when you show your weirdness, it will attract those people, repel the other people, and the internet is a really big place, and there is space for you and all of your interests, and if you just start to build the confidence to share that, it will do wonders for your work and your following. And, you know, it's a lot easier to make a higher volume of work and to feel motivated too when you're enjoying what you're making, and so, when you choose topics that you're already interested in, it takes away some of that friction of, oh my gosh, what should I make? Um, you know, I don't, I, you know, when you sit down and you stare at a blank page and you don't know what to do, picking up on your passions and finding a series and just being lighthearted with it and know, knowing that it's a passion project, if something cool happens with it, great. If nothing happens with it, cool. I have something for myself. And I think that's a really important point to make too is, when you focus on your passions or always infuse your passions into your work, at the very least, you're gonna end up with something for your portfolio that you're excited about, that you want to share, that kept you like excited and motivated, and that's really, really powerful. I did a project maybe three years ago that 
didn't really take off. It actually kind of flopped. And I remember being kind of bummed about it. But I put it in my portfolio. And three years later, I had a client reach out. And they were like, we want to commission five of these. And it was like a $15,000 project. It was amazing. So my friends and I like to consider that you know, you're planting the seeds for your future opportunities. So don't ever be too discouraged. So back to the beginning. I have been able to land serious projects like this, you know, like this Hallmark series, because of daily dishonesty. And I was able to work with MailChimp and get on the home page because I decided to make a silly ice cream light bulb illustration as the header for one of my marketing campaigns. And on the back end, they saw that and reached out to me. And I was able to book this project with Google because someone who worked there followed me on Instagram and reached out. And this is the kind of stuff I was posting on Instagram prior to getting that project with Google. Um, my bitch pancakes and sassy and gassy and follow your fucking dream soup. So I want to leave you with this because I know I'm out of time. How you create your art is the art. Your career is not this like defined point and once you reach this certain you know, level, you're going to be done. Your career is going to be ever evolving and you know, serious is whatever you make of it too. And if you are, as long as you're enjoying the process, like that, you're doing a good job. That's all you really have to do because so much is out of our control. Like I was saying at the beginning, when I used to look at other artists I admired doing all these cool projects, I would think to myself, how did they do it? And who knows? They were just trying new things. They were just putting themselves out there. So as long as you're enjoying the process, that is the most important part. And you know, how you create your art is the art. I want to leave you with that. And so make sure you're having fun. And that's a reminder to myself, too. Thank you.